Today's video is brought to you by literally one of my favorite services of all time, Audible. This is pretty much a dream sponsorship for me. I use Audible, and I'm not exaggerating, nearly every single day. I've listened to over 26 days worth of audiobooks on the platform. Basically how it works is you sign up for an Audible membership, then every month you get a credit for a free audiobook, plus two Audible originals, as well as other things like news digests and guided meditation programs. Once you've selected the book, you can download it and listen offline. I usually listen on my smartphone because I do a lot of driving and it's my best chance to get books in, but you can also listen across devices, and if one month you don't want to use your Audible credit, well, it rolls over automatically so you can get to the next month. If you're looking for something to listen to, well, Audible has pretty much every single Star Wars Legends and canon book. Personally, I would recommend the non-abridged versions, and a great place to start would be the 20th anniversary edition of the Thrawn trilogy. I also have a bi-weekly podcast with Corey, which is sort of a Star Wars book club, so if you don't have time to read that week's book, but still want to follow along, audiobooks are a good option. Otherwise, I would very highly recommend the Area X trilogy by Jeff Vandermeer. The first book is called Annihilation, and there was a movie that came out that I loved that was loosely based on the story. Anyway, Audible is great if you want to try it out for free. You can visit audible.com slash Eckhart's Ladder or text Eckhart's Ladder to 500 500. You'll get a free trial and you'll also be supporting the channel. Anyway, on with the content. The hyperspace tunnel opened, and this black thing came crawling out from between the stars. We thought it was a ghost ship, until it opened fire. Hey guys, this is Eckhart's Letter, hello and welcome to another Star Wars video. Let's get right into things. The real nasty thing about the Empire in Star Wars Legends is that after the Battle of Endor, it didn't really go away, it just broke into many small parts. You'd be just done fighting one admiral, then an Imperial Warlord would come out with a new Super Star Destroyer and cause you havoc. Or Han Solo would accidentally discover the Maw installation and we'd have new super weapons running around the galaxy. Stuff like that happened all the time. There were always new splinter groups with new fancy weapons to discover. However, sometimes even more troubling than that were cases of massive displays of power that could not directly be tied to a single warlord or imperial remnant faction. And that's the quote from above, which details how the New Republic encountered, for the first time actively at least, the Eclipse-class Super Star Destroyer. The ship, which was thought destroyed or unfinished, even by the best experts of the New Republic, was actually still in the hands of the Empire, and would soon spearhead a massive campaign against the galaxy. So we don't know where that quote came from or the exact context, but the Eclipse Super Star Destroyer actually has a lot of interesting backstory, and we'll talk about all of that, and then try to figure out what the Eclipse was doing before Operation Shadow Hand. So, as a brief description, the Eclipse was basically the first of a new line of Super Star Destroyers which would serve as the flagship of Emperor Palpatine when he was reborn about six years after his death at the Battle of Endor. The ship was absolutely massive, 17.5 kilometers long, slightly shorter than an Executor class Super Star Destroyer, but far, far more massive. The Eclipse was armed with a dizzying array of weapons, including most famously an axial super laser, which could destroy almost any target with a single shot. Both the Eclipse 1 and the Eclipse 2 would be destroyed by the New Republic, with the latter also taking out the Galaxy Gun and the majority of Palpatine's secret fleet over the planet Biss. However, although the New Republic kind of acts otherwise, they shouldn't have been so surprised by the emergence of the Eclipse class, and they really had ample opportunity to prepare for such a massive warship. Well, maybe not ample opportunity, they were sort of tied up by Grand Admiral Thrawn, but they should have at the very least seen it coming. We know from, for example, the Imperial Handbook that Rebel Intelligence knew of massive Super Star Destroyers like the Eclipse which may have been under construction. Still, they were widely seen as rumors. However, in 4 ABY, shortly after the Battle of Endor, the New Republic and the Zon Consortium would attack the Kuat shipyards, 
and find the partially constructed frame of the Eclipse class SSD. The Zon Consortium would then infiltrate and take over the Eclipse using its super laser to blast enemy vessels, including the Super Star Destroyer Annihilator. The Zon Consortium would then run off with the Eclipse, plundering the ship's information databanks before eventually discarding it, knowing that they didn't have enough personnel to fully run it, and the fact that it would be far, far too large of a target, especially given its incomplete state. The Empire would manage to recover the ship and return it to Kuwat. However, at this point, given the initial encounter and the use of New Republic intelligence, they definitely should have been aware of the vessel's existence and its partially complete state. Kuat, which was heavily fortified this time, continued work on the Eclipse. However, the vital shipyards would be attacked by the New Republic in 8 ABY, and the Eclipse would be used to ferry vital Imperial research scientists to the Deep Core. At this point, the Empire was losing massive territory across the galaxy, and their final strongholds were in the Deep Core and the Empire's most heavily guarded fortress worlds. One of these worlds was Bis, the Emperor's Citadel, where the Eclipse would stay for the rest of its life until seeing action. Palpatine was constructing many things at BIS, including the Second Eclipse SSD, the World Devastators, and other state-of-the-art technologies. The Imperial scientists there used everything they had learned over the past decade to finish the Eclipse One and also further upgrade existing systems. As she became ready for service, Palpatine, even before Shadow Hand, largely took up residence on the Eclipse and began commanding Imperial forces. This is also another point where the New Republic probably screwed up. Although Biss was heavily fortified, we see in the Dark Empire comics that they were still somewhat open to trade. Some smuggler connected to the New Republic could have made a fortune just by giving away the existence of the Eclipse, which was said to be holding over the planet as a sort of reminder of Imperial authority. I think it's likely at this point that the Eclipse first started doing those attack runs against the New Republic. It would have been fully finished here, and the Empire probably would have wanted to test out their newest toy before Operation Shadow Hand. I don't think it was during the war itself, because it's just not really presented that way, and the New Republic doesn't even seem to know which ship attacked them. The only way we know the connection is because it's made explicit in the new Essential Guide to Vessels. Lucky for the New Republic, they managed to cut short Palpatine's dreams for a new generation of super massive Star Destroyers with just the two Eclipse Dreadnoughts. We know that he planned for the Sovereign class, which at 15 kilometers long was sort of a miniaturized Eclipse, but still almost infinitely powerful. But those four initial ships never actually finished construction. And that's another interesting note about the Eclipse. That ship was so expensive that it barely made it through its construction life without being plundered by somebody in the Empire. There were calls to take the Eclipse apart and use the material for Star Destroyers to just abandon the process due to the extraordinary resource costs. However, most likely because of the presence and influence of Palpatine, that never happened. However, that's all I have for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed learning about the ghost ship, which could destroy fleets. Let me know what you thought about this and more down in the comments. Before we go, though, a quick hashtag ask at question of the day. Today's question comes from Attila, and it's an interesting one. Do you think it's possible for something stuck in hyperspace to be found by something else traveling in hyperspace? Perhaps if the original thing got stuck along a popular hyperspace lane. I do think that's possible, and we actually see in the Clone Wars that a trio of Star Destroyers sort of travel together throughout hyperspace, so if we imagine it as a separate dimension, sort of with a coexisting point in real space, it makes sense that you could be able to find other things there. However, that also brings up the question of why did nobody try to weaponize hyperspace lanes by adding blockages within hyperspace itself? Usually what people will do is put mines in real space, which will sort of knock ships out of their faster than light travel. But to my knowledge, I don't know of anyone actually mining the interior of hyperspace itself. So that's a very interesting question. I'm honestly not sure, but I wanted to bring it up because I'm curious to hear what the chat thinks. Anyway, if you guys have a question you'd like me to address, or in this case, not address in a future episode, leave it down below with the hashtag AskEck. That's going to be all from me today, guys. Thanks as always for your lovely support. Be very safe. Don't go outside if you don't need to. Do not let anybody cough on you. And may the force be with you.